I'm getting ready for my talk at Colonial Williamsburg later this month, and it is about the history of woodworking books. Um, I'm working on a thesis, uh, which I will present there at Williamsburg, but I thought you might like to see a timeline of woodworking books, uh, how they started and how they developed over the last few centuries. So we are gonna start in the 17th century with one of my favorite woodworking books, which is Flavian. So this is Principles of Architecture and Sculpture and Painting. And first, let me say that this is an astonishing book for the 17th century, uh, 1676 to 1690, as you can see here in my little notes. Beautiful plates, uh, really high quality compared to what else was being done in the world. Uh, this book started out as a dictionary um, that Falabian wrote. And Falabian was... Uh, he was the recorder of parties for the king, and he also was admitted to the, uh, the Royal Academy of Sculpture. So definitely in the king's uh, pocket, uh, must have gotten some nice engravings. But this started out as a dictionary of arts and sciences, and it got just out of hand. So the back half is a dictionary, which is great, for, especially for those of us who do translations. And the front half are explanations of what's going on in each plate. Um, I refer back to Flavian an awful lot and just absolutely love this book, but it is problematic in some ways, but you'll have to come to Williamsburg to find out. Next up is we cross the channel and we have uh, Joseph Moxon's uh, Mechanic Exercises, which came out, started coming out in 1677, soon after Falabian. And Moxon uh, has some royal connections. He was a uh, hydro hydrographer to the king for a while, but he was an independent uh, tradesperson and worked with tradespeople uh, to make his mathematical instruments um, and uh, was not stupid about the mechanical arts at all. Uh, he wrote this and uh, uh, one of his reasonings was to uh, have the trades help each other, uh, which is sort of an interesting perspective on it. Uh, he also is famous for having swiped uh, the plates from Falabian. So when you look at the planes uh, for uh, hand planes for Falabian uh, and for Moxon, they're the same. So these are French hand planes in an English book. No, no, bad, bad. Uh, but fantastic book, first English language book on woodworking probably won't teach you anything about how to do woodworking uh, if you knew anything. Come over here not soon later. Uh, is a book that doesn't get a lot of attention. Neves, the city and county country purchaser. And of course, the title is not very exciting, but it is one hell of a book. Um, Neve is a pseudonym. And so this was a mechanical dictionary that was printed um, uh, under pseudonym and a little later than Moxon, but goes into a lot more detail about the tools uh, and uh, is, it's basically an encyclopedia, uh, but instead of little short entries that says, the ax is so simple, anyone sh can use it, which is what Moxon said, he goes into great detail. There's some good stuff in here, especially about some of uh, the planes and uh, you know Philister planes and stuff like that. Uh, great little book. We printed in 1969. Um, and then we get into the era of encyclopedias. And so uh, both in uh, England and in France, uh, the, uh, you know, people are starting to want to record all the knowledge out there. That's actually the democratization of knowledge. And the big daddy of them all is, of course, uh, uh, Diderot. And this is, of course, the littlest Diderot. <laughs> uh, this is a copy of just all the plates. And this book is a reprint of the uh, ones for furniture making and, and the text. So this is uh, 1751 when it starts to come out, and it is a scandal. Um, the king doesn't like it, the Catholic Church doesn't like it because they question miracles, uh, that if did miracles happen. Everybody's upset about this. Diderot gets jailed. Dulembert leaves the project. Uh, lots of other people are jailed, uh, but it is uh, a monumental work of recording um, just about all the uh, arts and uh, crafts at the time. Um, they, the, the, the sections on furniture making are a little uh, short, but there's still some good information in there, real useful. Soon after that, 
crossing back over to uh, uh, Great Britain, uh, is we have Thomas Chippendale's Gentleman and Cabinet Makers Director, 1754. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the beginning of the pattern books. And these are sort of a separate current that runs through uh, the woodworking history. These aren't plans, but they are very definitely uh, more like style magazines, uh, showing you what is in fashion and different ways you could uh, decorate things. Uh, this is where Chinese Chippendale uh, came from. And this is one of the most uh, famous of the pattern books. There are about 20 uh, woodworking pattern books and a whole bunch more when it comes to architecture and uh, uh, other decorative arts. Other stuff here, I pulled out uh, the Chairmaker's Guide by uh, Manwaring, Robert Manwaring. Um, if for the only reason that somewhere in here, and I'll find it, is this is a cheap print-on-demand copy, uh, but there is the first uh, measured drawing. It does uh, show how to lay out the parts uh, for one of these frame chairs and uh, discusses, uh, discusses that process. It's not a lot of information, but uh, it's, it's the first measured drawing uh, plan that's like, hey, here, you go try to build this, uh, why don't you? So uh, this is man wearing, which is, uh, like I said, 1765, uh, yeah. Big Daddy Vimal, don't have to introduce him. It's Andre Jacques Rubo, uh, 1769 is when uh, this monumental work came out. This, for me, is uh, one of the most important, if not the most important, woodworking book of the 18th century, just because Roubaix was a practitioner, and Roubaix uh, went out into the shops, he wrote it, he drew most of this, uh, he uh, just went all the way. And uh, his, uh, I think his main reason for doing this, it's, it's hard to say because there is no preface from Roubaix, is to uh, preserve knowledge uh, from, from one trade to another. And so uh, I really don't need to talk too much about Roubaix except for to say, wow, it is, uh, you know, almost all the woodworking uh, trades in um, five books. Uh, these books from the Fr uh, Acad French Academy of Sciences started coming fast and hard. Uh, and so this is Hugh Lowe, uh, which is the art of the turner or the mechanical turner. And so this is basically what uh, uh, Roubaix was for cabinet making and carriage making. This is for uh, the turner. Uh, lots of good stuff in here. Um, just another one of those other huge books that somebody needs to translate. Um, we have more pattern books that occur on either side of these. And so we've got like uh, Heppel White, and here is uh, uh, one of Sheraton's books. These are just more uh, build this, build this. And uh, Her Sheraton and Heppelwhite were particularly important to American cabinet makers because uh, these styles became very popular in the United States. Not all of them made the great leap across the Atlantic, but Sheraton and Heppelwhite and Chippendale in particular really uh, hit home with the American furniture makers and uh, whole styles developed around their, uh, uh, their books. So about 1812, we have Peter Nicholson, who is um, a, he's a joiner, uh, writes uh, several books on, uh, this one is now called Mechanics Companion, but they go by very various names. It's essentially an updating of Moxon. He starts off by saying that Moxon is now, of course, useless and irrelevant, so let me tell you uh, what's important. It's basically uh, Moxon 2, Dreams Come True. Uh, it's really good stuff. There's more detail, of course because uh, this is many years later, um, but it's essentially not exactly a practical 100% you can do this from scratch guide. 1839, uh, this isn't one of the most important books, but it is for me a change in how books are being used. So this is the joiner and cabinet maker published anonymously in 1839. And what's interesting about this little book, which has almost no plates, is it's a fictitious account, uh, semi-veiled, um, you know, uh, autobiography of a guy and his uh, uh, rosy-colored apprenticeship. And it's supposed to be a book, well, I'm just going to be honest about it, it's propaganda. So this is trying to, uh, to give you a book to give to your parents to, uh, to try to convince them to go into the trades. And so this is where, you know, these books are starting to become very cheap. This one is a paperback. Uh, what we would call a paperback. They're very inexpensive, uh, lots of people can afford them, and so they're being used as, as uh, trade propaganda. 
All right, we're entering the middle part of the 19th century. Uh, Holtzoffel uh, published uh, three or four, I forget uh, exactly, maybe four, books uh, basically about uh, turning and uh, mechanical, mechanical manipulation and the cutting action of tools. This is, one of, this is my favorite, which is uh, volume three, I think. And uh, this deals with a lot of uh, square furniture making stuff. What's interesting about this is that Holtzoffel sells tools. So this isn't exactly propaganda, but it isn't exactly uh, completely clean scholarship either. Um, a lot of this stuff deals with the, uh, the tools that they sell, especially some of the Rose engines and, uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but they are, uh, let's just say, providing some good information that will make you want to get out in the shop and maybe buy some tools. Yep. Here's another weird little corner of woodworking publishing. And so this is 1864. We're getting into what we would call the Victorian era. era. I love these little books. Uh, they're called, it's John Gay's Book for Boys and uh, Work for Boys. And they're these little woodworking books and there's little stories and uh, you know, little advice on how to make stuff uh, for your, your fort, your clubhouse, or uh, your pirate ship, or whatever, but it all involves woodworking. They're making a ladder here, which is awesome. Stories, they're great fun to read, um, but they're also just really moralistic. <laughs> and uh, So this is where they started using woodworking instruction to also teach people morals, uh, little kids morals, so more, more kind of interesting propaganda. A little bit later, here we have uh, Holly's Art of Saw Filing, and now books are getting so inexpensive and so widespread that uh, we can get very, very technical stuff that is for the professional. So about this time, a lot of the mechanical newspapers are coming online, and so this sort of uh, technical information uh, is, is uh, being spread everywhere, and so information is, is becoming much easier to get and, and, and share. So Holly, here's a complete book on saw filing, and before, you know, you would have like a sentence on saw filing in, in an earlier book. So we'll cross the Rubicon here, and I went a little backwards here. Uh, 1901 is, I consider, a watershed year in woodworking publishing because that's when the woodworker, a British magazine, started publishing. And this is, they offered bound copies of uh, their editions of their, you know, the, the issues at the end of the year. And so I consider it a woodworking book. This is like really the first, I think, solid, awesome, fantastic, long-lasting attempt to train home woodworkers with a magazine or a book. Of course, you could get some of this training uh, beforehand in schools, uh, but here you could stay at home, uh, read about it. There's measured drawings, there's plans, there's instructions. No one has eclipsed the woodworker. This is sort of the prototype for all future woodworking magazines. Um, a few years later than that, something less ha uh, fun begins, and that's Paul N. Hasluck. Nothing wrong with the guy. But this is the regurgitation stage begins. And so this book, um, it looks great. I mean, you look at it like so much pictures and words. Oh my gosh, this is everything. A doghouse, a bench. Well, uh, this is basically all regurgitated uh, from the mechanical magazines and from other. A little later, here we have Audell's Carpenter's Builder's Guide. This is like Holly on steroids, and it's also regurgitation. So uh, here we have, uh, these are for uh, carpenters, and this is everything you need to know as a carpenter. These are your day-to-day -day books that you would have uh, maybe you know, on the shelf at home. I don't think you would take them to the job site because people would laugh at you. Uh, but it does show you very basic information all the way up to very highly advanced information about laying out uh, roofs and uh, everything. So these, I think, might even still be in print, but these have been in print since the early 20s. Another huge watershed for me is uh, the, the USDA, uh, the Department of Agriculture, issues the Wood Handbook in 1935, 36. And this is not, this is a slightly later one, but this is free, and this is tons and tons of government 
information about wood as a building material. And it is where you really get into the nitty gritty about expansion and contraction and stress loads and all the things that uh, are, are necessary for our big modern culture. I have uh, several versions of this book. They do kind of change over the years. And uh, uh, the earlier ones I actually like better than the later ones, but you know, that's a personal problem. Hi, Wally. Okay, also in the 1950s, here is Bernard Jones. This is over in uh, Great Britain. More regurgitation, but on a higher scale. Uh, Bernard Jones did a little better job of uh, regurgitating stuff. But here we start having these lovely book sets that start appearing everywhere. And uh, these you can you know, keep on your shelf. They're very handsome. And uh, you can show people, I'm a woodworker. I have all these books. And... Uh, but they're also really quite good books. But you buy the set, and it makes you an instant good woodworker. 1950, this is just a personal side for me. Uh, Charles Hayward uh, became a uh, editor in the 30s of uh, The Woodworker, and they start regurgitating his stuff, and he edits it, and he turn, puts out several absolutely amazing books, and this one is called Woodwork Joints which is just one of my top 10 favorite woodworking books uh, that are practical of all time. Really highly qu high quality, uh, useful information. Seek out a copy for yourself if you don't have one already. Don't get the Sterling one. Sorry if anyone from Sterling is in the audience. Um, now we're getting into the textbooks. Uh, you know, everything becomes uh, to be in mechanized. This, this is Ferrier, or, I, or you say Ferrier. I'm not sure how you say it. But as the machines uh, take over after World War II, this is 1967, these giant textbooks in teaching people industrial woodworking uh, start to appear. And they're really useful for uh, working the machines, but there's almost, this is where handwork really starts to get the short shrift. So I don't spend too much time with these, but if I do ever uh, need to know uh, how to make a 1970s uh, panel dungeon, this is your book. Encyclopedia of for, uh, Furniture Making uh, in England, this was the, the kind of the standard. <laughs> this is Ernest Joyce, uh, and this one was updated by Alan Peters. Uh, pretty good book, probably better than uh, Ferrier, sorry, but uh, I have to, have to say it. So another book, lots of veneering, lots of, uh, lots of 1970s kind of stuff in there. And then I'm going to end with Tafrid Teaches Woodworking. Uh, and so here we have uh, kind of what I think is a great kind of full circle is we have someone like Rubeau who is uh, trying, he's a tradesperson, he's very good, he's very good at explaining things, and he has created this three book set uh, on how to um, do just about everything in woodworking, hand tool, power tool. It's just a really great set to, to start with and uh, represents, you know, a lot of what's best in, in the woodworking uh, publishing field.